up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number seven. My name is Phil Johnson. I am your host for the show. And we have a very special episode for you today. Now, usually, uh, if that happens on TV, a very special episode, you know the show's about to tank. But that is not the case here. No, we have a special episode today with the painter Don Mates. Now, you may not know the name unless you're deep in the pirate community. And if you're not, that's okay. Welcome to the show. Don Mates is a fantastic painter. He paints pirate stuff. He paints fantasy stuff. He paints book covers. If you are, if you read science fiction or fantasy at all, you have read a book that features a Don Mates painting on the cover of the book. Uh, he's super, really great stuff. He's the uh, the creator of the Captain Morgan rum character, which is really great, uh, and because uh, that is an iconic pirate character, uh, no matter how um, not historically correct it may be. We talk about how it's not historically correct. We talk about, uh, we're going to talk about stolen paintings. We're going to talk about some of the inner workings of the advertising industry, madman style. We're going to talk about book covers. We're going to talk about oil paints. This is a really, really fun interview. And I have been holding it in check. I've been holding it back. I've been keeping this one in my pocket for a special episode. And today's, the reason today is special is because this is the first episode of Under the Crossbones that is on iTunes. I submitted it to iTunes recently, uh, and it should be up on iTunes as of uh, the time you're listening to this episode. Uh, the other uh, six episodes also will be up, but this is the first one that's like premiering on iTunes. So I need a favor from you. The first two weeks of a show on iTunes is the most important because uh, there is the new and notable list, right? And that is where a whole bunch of subscribers, new subscribers come from that will al allow me to keep doing this show for you. So here's what I need to get on and stay on the new and notable list is reviews and ratings, right? So I need you to go to iTunes, go to find under the crossbones, give it a nice five-star rating, write a little review there, and that is going to be a giant help in making this show go forward, which I, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you want it to go forward. I do too. It's super fun. Just go in, give it a, a nice five-star rating, and that is going to be a giant help. If you're not familiar with iTunes, I'm going to uh, – I'll put up a little post on underthecrossbones.com about how to leave a review on iTunes, and that would be a giant, giant help to me, and I appreciate it. Um, you can already – you've been able to subscribe on Android since we started. Now you can also subscribe with your iPhone through iTunes if that is your podcatcher of choice. Uh, so please do that for me. We are on iTunes this week. Uh, it's been a weird week. It's been a lot of fixing stuff this week. Uh, my websites were hacked. My laptop was slow. My toilet was broken. Uh, just like uh, it's, uh, my back fence we needed fix. It's just been like fixing stuff for a week. And uh, primarily we've been working. I did get the sites unhacked, which was nice. That took all of Saturday. But we spent a good chunk of time this weekend trying to figure out what we're doing with our lawn. My girlfriend and I, we own a house here in California. And you may have heard that we're having a, a little bit of a drought here in California. Uh, basically, we don't have weather anymore. Weather is done. We're a post-weather society here in California. And we're trying to figure out what to do with our very brown lawn. Uh, now, I say our lawn is brown because of the drought. Our lawn was brown two years before the drought because we're trendsetters. And we were setting the trend uh, for saving water well before anybody else. Because, uh, I mean, that... It's because I didn't want to pay for extra water, really. So we have a giant brown lawn that we're trying to figure out what to do with. And so we're going we're gonna to mulch it. We're going to do like a nice little low water design. There are – I have a big lawn. We're coming – we ordered 150 bags of mulch, 150 bags of mulch. Can you – that is two pallets, two truckloads of mulch that will be coming to my house sometime in the next couple days that I then have to spread over my lawn. I'm not a, a. I've never been a big fan of manual labor. It's why I'm a comedian and a musician. It's it's. Uh, I don't like to. I don't like to sweat unless there's an audience in front of me. That's pretty much my rule. So, it's going to be. That's what I'm going to be doing this week is spreading mulch on my lawn. But I also have shows because I, there's always got to be shows, right? Next week I'm going to be at the uh, World Series of Comedy in Las Vegas. Very cool event. If you happen to be in Las Vegas during the week of 
September 21st through the 26th. Come by the Tuscany Hotel and Casino and check out the World Series of Comedy. It's a really super fun event. 101 comedians from all over the country, some international. And I will be on the Thursday 9 p.m. show. And it is a competition, World Series Comedy, like World Series Poker. And if I do well, I'll end up on the Saturday shows like I did last year. It was really great. Hoping to do the same this year. What I've been doing as far as sets... Uh, I've been doing sets all over the Bay Area, getting ready for the World Series. So if you're going to be in Vegas next week, definitely come out and check out the World Series comedy. Tickets are reasonable. Uh, you can get all the information at the world. Uh, what is it? The World Series of Comedy dot com or Phil Johnson Comedy dot com. You can get it on my site too. This week, however, I will be Wednesday. September the 16th, I will be at the San Jose Improv opening for my good friend Jeff Applebaum. He's super great. You've seen him on the Late Late Show, things like that. Very funny guy. Thursday, September the 17th, I'll be at the Blue Lagoon in Santa Cruz. Friday, September the 18th, I will be at a place in San Francisco that I can't pronounce. I think it's called Balancoir, Balancoir, something like that. It's got a B and a C and an OI, and there's too many vowels. Balancoir, I think, in San Francisco on Friday the 18th. Saturday, September the 19th, I will be at the Granada Theater in Morgan Hill. Always love theater shows. Those are so much fun. So lots of shows to see. PhilJohnsonComedy.com is where you can check that out. Uh, and I've got lots of national tour dates coming up. I'm going to be in Oregon, Nevada, Michigan, uh, Minnesota and uh, Illinois coming up pretty soon. So go check all that stuff out. Let's get to the interview here. We're going to jump in. Uh, oh, there is comedy music on the show, as always. Comedy music to smooth you back into your regular life. Uh, today's comedy is from David Niker, a very beardful gentleman. He's got a very large beard. Not a hipster beard. Big, big man beard. He's got a big man beard. And that plays into the bit you're going to hear a little bit. So uh, it's a very cool uh, Dave Niker, uh, very funny bit. Music today. Now, look, here's the thing. We are seven episodes into this show now. And I have not played you any of my work. And I've done that kind of on purpose because I don't want to just, you know, be shoving my stuff down your throat uh, like I do at the beginning of the show. So what, what I want to do today, I do want to play one of my songs today. And I'm known as a comedian. I'm known for writing funny songs, things like that. But this is a song that I put out uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and it's called Kissing in the Rain. And it is a legitimate sweet little love song um, that I actually wrote for my girlfriend. I hope you like it. It's one of my favorite pieces that I've ever written. We did a cool little uh, lyric video for it that's on YouTube, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to play you Kissing in the Rain today, which is one of my songs, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's do this. Let's get into our interview with Don Mates, the painter. Here it is. Thanks. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you. You, you uh, do really great work. Um, and I've been reading up on you a little bit, uh, so it's very cool. So uh, why don't you explain to me and uh, the listeners uh, what it is you do? What's your forte? I am what's called an imaginative realist, which means that I use my imagination and try to paint as realistically as possible so that you believe what you're seeing is actually there. And it comes in handy when I am doing uh, the, the fantastic artwork, fantastic creatures, science fiction, and it also is very handy doing things like pirates because I'm able to do historical research and then imagine what it might look like and using uh, various bits of, uh, of historical reference. Sometimes it's uh, reading material and sometimes it's, it's visual material like going on period ships or um, you know, doing some sailing and, and taking that experience and, and bringing it and making it come to life by virtue of you know, my artistic abilities. That's great. And so I I noticed in some of your work, I mean, are you referencing at all like old woodcuts or or anything from the, the, the Captain Johnson book or anything like that for your pirate uh, paintings? Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, it, it, the, what's interesting about that time period is very little is known about it. Uh, actually, uh, there weren't any... Uh, uh, blueprints of ships at that time. Most of the ships were made by um, models, ship models, and then shipwrights would build off of models and they would use it to scale. So blueprints actually, you know, were, were later in in history, you know, toward the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And so a lot of, you know, what, what we call the golden age of piracy from like 1650 to, you know, 1750 in that area, there isn't a lot of uh, research available that is, uh, you know, except for paintings by, you know, like Dutch artists and things like this. So it's, it's very difficult to get a handle on exactly what things were like back then. 
And so things like woodcuts are um, are very valuable because you know there was you know eyes on so to speak of what was what was going on and, and old paintings and the same thing with a lot of costumes. A lot of costumers go to um, 16th century paintings to look at what people were wearing as opposed to you know uh, guessing. You know so a lot of you know art in the, at the time period became historical research. Oh, that's interesting. I had no idea that they were working off just. Uh... Uh, ship models like that that's really too bad none of those are around that would be an interesting find well you know i mean shipwrights knew their you know for for years and years and years they were you know i mean if you go to scotland you know scotland used to be wooded and so was england and and pretty much you know the age of sail took down every tree in the in those countries you know yeah. they're uh, and uh, it's interesting. There are books that show exactly what part of the tree became what part of a ship, and uh, and so you know they they really knew their thing. From you know it's like basically they they could look at a tree and say, okay, we can get you know this much of the ship done from from this forest, and uh, and and so you know blueprints of things became you know much later. And when you would when you would sell a ship to somebody, you know someone who would sponsor a, a, to have a ship built, you know they wanted to see what they were getting and. So a model was actually more um, dynamic than a drawing was, because a lot of uh, you know people back then didn't really couldn't extrapolate from a drawing, you know, a side view and a, and a front view. But when they looked at a, a ship model, they go, "Oh yeah, you know, man, we want we want it bigger than this, or we want it smaller. <laughs> we want more, you know, more sails. And what happens if the you know if we rig it differently? And so, you know, a model was much more um, a visceral experience for you know for everyone involved." Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, I guess that's why our our special effects guys now still work that way. It, uh, you can, it's sure. much, yeah, well, it's much much easier to visualize all that stuff. So then, how do you go about something like? Because uh, I mean, besides your your pirate work, you do a lot of fantasy and science fiction and things like that. So yeah. when you're dealing with uh, uh, dragons and magic, how do you go about researching a visualization on something like that? Well, you uh, it's it sort of becomes something like a Frankenstein situation where you know you take uh, the scales of, of of this kind of a of an animal and then you say the the wings of a of a bat or a bird and you and you kind of bump them together and then see if you can make the uh, make the the biology work. But you know sometimes you know you would use. Uh, you know, a you know, take up you know the, the position of a bird in flight, and then you would you know try and put the skin of a lizard on that, and then you would take the feathers and see if you can keep them or or move them into bat wings or 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 things like this. And you know, you've got to again use your imagination. How can you uh, you know use this research? And a lot of it is you know your 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 inspiration may come from a, a position of of the light on a particular bird, say, and then you take that lighting and then you imagine it onto uh, different surfaces and sometimes you make models you know and and that helps as well sometimes clay sculptures or you know whatever just so that you can have as much information as possible you know you the end result is you want people to believe what they're seeing actually exists so anything is fair game to try to to get that to happen right right and and that's uh your work is really interesting in that your work looks like the classic fantasy art like when people think of fantasy science fiction art that's your style that's exactly what it looks like i was looking over some of your book covers today uh, especially like the the raymond e feist and things like that which i i read as a teenager over and over and over again so uh, it was kind of exciting to see those um where let's back up a little bit i mean where where do you come from uh originally childhood things like that I came from Central Connecticut. I grew up in a, in a plain in a in a little plain village called Plainville, <laughs> and uh, which makes me a plain villain. So um, <laughs> pirates became kind of natural. Uh, it's in Central Connecticut, and it was you know basically it was an old farm town that kind of uh, became overdeveloped. But uh, living in Central Connecticut, I. Um, I had access to um, New York City eventually. Uh, where I got started was I read a lot of comic books, and I got interested in uh, that whole environment because there were pictures, and I was drawn to pictures very much. And, and comic books were, you know, accessible as a as a youngster and easy to read. And and um, I decided that you know I would be drawing. When I drew, I drew comic book characters. 
And on the back of a comic book, there was um, advertisements, and, and some people remember these. It was a, a picture of Norman Rockwell, and he was sitting at his easel, and he was saying, "If," um, and it was an ad for the um, artist correspondence course that he helped found. Right. And it was a bunch of artists that you know would basically you know like uh, do mail in, and they would do critiques, and they would hand out booklets and things. And but the the come on was if you can draw Bambi and this pirate, we can make an artist out of you. <laughs> So at 13 years old, I, you know, I, I did my Bambi and my pirate, and uh, you know, they, they said, well, you know, you're young, but you know, you're, you're obviously talented at doing this, and my parents agreed to sign me up for the course. So when I was 13, I started getting, uh, you know, semi-professional critiques on, on my work, and I'm still drawing pirates to this day. I mean, you know, so if you, you know, I mean, you know, it, it started right there at 13, you know. Um, and then I graduated high school, and I really wanted to become an artist um, against uh, most of my uh, guidance counselor's wishes because I had uh, reasonably good grades in school, and he thought that I was throwing away my education by going to an art school and not a college that specified in art. But what I was very conscious of was what the schools were teaching that was available to me. And when I went into a school, I looked at what the students were drawing on the walls, not what you know their programs uh, advertised. And I really didn't want to go into abstract expressionism or anything like that. And that's where I got where the degree programs were. And I wanted to learn how to draw and paint better. And at the time, I was uh, almost uh, accepted into the comic book industry. I had actually done some comics that were uh, available at the time, some spot illustrations. And I knew a local comic book artist who uh, had me ghosting on some of his pages. And he took me into New York City to interview people at DC Comics. So I was very close to becoming a professional comic book artist. And at the time, I was um, attending art school, and I was just learning how to figure out changing drawing or line drawing into painting. And I was just starting to get a handle on that, and I didn't really want to quit what I was learning to go into the comic book business. So I decided to continue with, with the art school training. And at the time, an artist named Frank Brazetta was um, opening up a whole industry by virtue of him doing the uh, Conan the Barbarian covers and Creepy and Eerie covers and uh, John Carter and Mars and, and a number of other things that have become very, very popular, and a lot of it was because of the dynamics of his artwork. So I was very heavily influenced in, in what he was doing, and, and, and his work was very much based in the comic book industry, but he was painting, and he was using the exaggeration of comics and, and putting it into paints, and he was doing a, a bang-up job of it, and he actually opened up a whole... Uh, heroic fantasy um, portion of of the publishing um, industry, and it's still alive today. And uh, so when I got out of art school, I had geared my portfolio in that direction. And it's interesting that, you know, my first published work was um, Fantasy Pirates, you know. I mean, so, you know, I mean, my very first commission cover had to do with, with pirates. They were actually monkeys that were pirates. <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, I mean, it was, it was interesting. You know, I got a manuscript and, you know, basically I said, yes, I'll take the job. And then I read the manuscript and said, what am I going to do with this? You know, I mean, I got these, these monkeys and this guy went to Cornell University and the rest of them were a bunch of chimps. And how am I going to make a painting out of this? You know, and um, it was interesting. I, I actually can say um, something that uh, most, most people can't really say. Um, I, of course, when I do this, I, I photograph models because there's just too much information you need to make it look believable and models really help it along. If you imagine everything out of your head, you just can't think of all the lighting and all the, the musculature and everything. So having a model get into a pose is really helpful, even if it's, you know, if, if the end result is going to be something fantastic, being able to say, okay, the light works this way on an arm or a hand or something like this. So I, um, I had my dad posing, climbing over a picnic table, and he was wearing kitty goggles, and I put a, a jigsaw puzzle um, on his back, and it was strapped around his chest, and I had a, a vacuum cleaner hose coming out of the puzzle box so he had you know an air breather situation coming out of his mouth so you know here he is climbing over a picnic table in a bathing suit wearing you know wearing all his junk all over him when the neighbors were wondering you know what's going on at this house you know so they came over being nosy and I said we're posing for a book cover do you want to help and I gave him a club and kitty goggles put him over and and you know 
took all these pictures, and the next thing you know, they they became chimpanzees. So I made a monkey out of my dad and my neighbor. That's fantastic. And how old were you at that point? Uh, probably 22, 23, something like that. So that answers my other question as to how um, supportive your parents were of the artistic career. Because my, my parents have always been supportive of my uh, career as a performer, but I know a lot of parents aren't into that type of thing. Well, my parents were, my dad gave me the lecture. He said, um, uh, be smart, you know, be a be a, a plumber, be an electrician, you know, be a mechanic. It's always good to know that. And he said, with my big mouth, I'd be a great politician. Uh-huh. Um, but instead, uh, you know, I decided to be an artist, and he actually uh, became enamored of the idea. He knew it was going to be very difficult. And when he retired, he was kind of, driving my mother bonkers being around the house all the time. So I um, sort of employed him to help me make picture frames. Ah, that's great. I, I have a very similar situation. My dad uh, uh, moves gear at my gigs and loves to carry the guitar. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that's very cool. So um, I, uh, as you were talking about the, the, the covers and things like that, one, one question I've always had about the covers of books is how do you go about – Figuring out what scene is going to like sum up the book concisely, um, especially if there's not necessarily like physical descriptions of the characters and things like that. Is there a lot of back and forth with the author on something like that? Uh, usually not the author because you know I'm technically hired by the publisher who's paying both myself and the author. Uh-huh. Uh, some publishers encourage dialogue between the artist and the author, and sometimes not. Uh, I knew Raymond Feist before I did the covers for him. Um, actually, my wife, um, Jannie Wirtz, collaborated on um, a trilogy that they wrote together called Daughter of the Empire. Uh-huh. And um, so, you know, I mean, I knew Ray from before, and when I was working on the books, um, if there was a problem, I could I could talk to him, but basically it's it's discouraged. And what basically you're doing is you're trying to, you know, sell a product, which is a book. And so what you want is people to, you know, be attracted to it and pick it up and put something on there that would attract people. And using, you know, your artistic skills, making a um, a dynamic graphic that would um, entice people to want to approach it is is the major job. And um, what I found was if there wasn't anything interesting in the story, I would look into things like the title of the book because, you know, the author is using that as a selling point for what the story is about. So I would look through the story and see where the title would key in because, you know, there's a, a word image recognition going on on the cover. You know, if it's like, you know, like, you know, you know, Uncle Sam goes to, you know, goes to Mars, you know, then I could, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, that title will, will make images in my head if, if there isn't a scene in the book. And sometimes, you know, there's a, an explicit scene in the book that says, wow, you know, if I put this on the cover, people will be very attracted to it. So it's a, you know, every, every book is different. You know, what, what I find is the, the most difficult is like a collection of short stories because, you know, it's a, it's a scattershot sort of a situation. You know, you're not trying to find the magic book bullet. You're trying to find the magic buckshot, you know, and um, that makes it, you know, a little more difficult. I recently illustrated um, a re-release of Stephen King's The Shining, and in doing the illustrated book, one of my situations was I didn't want to have all the illustrations at the front or in the back. I wanted them spread out, so I read the book and then kind of put little post-it notes in the scenes that were sort of evenly spaced between the books so that I would give a, um, a continuous illustrated journey, if you will, through the book where it was based about 100 pages apart. And in that case, were you uh, consciously trying to wa- stay away from anything Jack Nicholson related or movie related? Absolutely. No, I did not, you know, rent the movies either. You know, I guess there was a TV show and a Jack Nicholson version. And, you know, although I saw it and it was in my mind, I was using the book as my Bible because basically they were hiring me to illustrate the book, not, you know, do comments on what the movie was about. So, you know, the the book became my Bible and I stayed away from any, any you know, visual things um, that were related to it, except for, um, you know, the hotel itself. You know, uh-huh. I, I was looking at what Kubrick picked and what um, Stephen King used as inspiration and I kind of did something in between the both of them. Um, 
but you know, and the book will be out next next year. I just finished the job, but it hasn't been found or, or put together yet. Oh, that's uh, fantastic! Cemetery Dance. It's a small press. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to that because that's uh, one of my top ten movies, and the book is fantastic too. So I, I definitely would. It love really to see is, what you but did. what yeah. you didn't get from the the movie as much because you know, I mean, it was all about Jack. Um, it was that the the hotel itself was the the evil presence. Oh you know, sure. So trying to make the, the hotel actually have a um, have a, a a character in the in the illustrations I was doing was was one of my prime goals in this. It was like you know everyone was affected by the hotel. It wasn't you know that they you know they were pretty much puppets of the hotel. Right. Did you find it? Um, or do you find it difficult to put? Um, to turn an in- inanimate object into a character since, I mean, most of your characters are actual people? Uh, it was, it was fun. It was, it was a, it was a challenge and it was fun. You know, I mean, in one of the paintings, what I, what I did was I used smoke coming out of the, the chimney and made that into a, into a visual that Stephen King alluded to. So, you know, it, it, it added a, a personality to it. And I, and then I did some things where I animated things around the hotel as if the hotel was, was affecting, you know, the atmosphere and the wind and so forth. Interesting. That, oh, I can't wait to see it. That's going to be so cool. It's going to be very, very good. When does it come out next year? Uh, I, I don't know the exact date. You know, I mean, I'm, I, you know, basically, I. It's a sign, an artist signed edition. Stephen King didn't sign this, um, this particular illustrated book, but um, they haven't sent me the pages to, so I, I don't. It won't be bound yet, but I guess you know it is scheduled for you know late fall, early next year release. Oh, okay, great. Um, just. Check out, you know, Cemetery Dance Publishing and see when they start listing it. Yeah, I definitely will, and uh, we'll we'll make follow up notes about that for sure. I was I was looking at some of your paintings today, and what I I really love the way that you do your signatures on them, where it's not uh, you don't just slap a signature on the bottom right corner like most painters would. Uh, you you work them into the design. It's carved into a barrel or or on on somebody's ring or carved into the barrel of a of a pistol. I think that's really interesting. What uh, what made you? When did you first try to do that? Uh, the first time I did that was way back um, doing um, creepy and eerie magazines, and this is when I first came out of art school. I put my name on a on a tombstone, which is kind of you know like. Uh, Maybe not, you know, the most wise thing to, um, you know, to to be adding your name to, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, yes, it's going to happen, but why hurry it along, you know? Um, but uh, as I as I did more and more paintings, what I found was that, you know, people have a, you know, a dashing signature or a, you know, a, a particular uh, emblem that they use to sign. And I just, you know, I mean, I just couldn't say that, you know, this is me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, a, a handwritten signature, you kind of evolves. But, you know, when you put your st- Stamp on a painting, it's uh, it's something that's that's kind of personal, and and you know you try to do something that may be universal, so everybody would recognize it. And you know I I went the other way, saying that you know like um, if you're familiar with an artist named Howard Pyle, yes, who was absolutely. the father of American illustration, and he did this you know terrific book of pirates and he was you know he taught nc wyeth and all this and his when he was a teacher he said you know put yourself into your paintings you know believe that you're the characters that you're painting so you can really immerse yourself into um what's going on the scenario you're painting so you can you can feel the emotion that you're trying to convey so you know put yourself into these into these things and i'm saying well you know why not put my signature into the painting you know as as you know so i can sort of add myself within what's going on in the work. So that just seemed like a an extension of, of, of me being part of the painting. And in a in a when I'm doing something with sea rovers, it's almost like I'm a stowaway within the painting. <laughs> uh, I did some work for National Geographic and they really frown upon artists signing their their work. You know, they, they say, you know, you get a credit in the magazine and, and that's enough. We don't want you having a signature on the painting. Uh-huh. And so uh-huh. I um you know, I said, Well, we'll fix that, you know. So <laughs> I uh, I hid my signature in it and so that, you know, it's very, very, very difficult to find and I got you know, I got past the National Geographic um um uh, eyeballers to see if they could find my signature in it and um they actually run contests. Can you find the signature in this painting? And what's actually fun is I've I've done some 
exhibits of um, pirates and sea rovers at various museums and I tell the docents that you know my signature is hidden within the painting and you know you might want to you know offer you know, offer prizes to kids to see if they can find all the signatures in the paintings and so it becomes a sort of a treasure hunt looking for the artist's signature that's great wow. yeah it's like it's like easter eggs and it, uh, yeah. it'll, it'll be real interesting you know three generations from now when they're trying to authenticate your work to see if uh if whoever was uh trying to rip you off got it right and put the signature in the right place <laughs> yeah well one time i you know it, it, it is a two-edged sword because sometimes i hide it so well i can't find it and then you know i mean i actually had one painting where i signed it twice and i went uh oh you know and and another time um as i'm doing book covers you know, you kind of lose control of what happens. And I did this one book cover where I was very clever in my in signing my name. And it was, you know, it was you know, if you if you knew where it was or you could locate it, you could you could see it. And unfortunately, they published the the, the book cover backwards, and <laughs> nobody got the signature on that one. Oh my gosh, that's funny. I have to go look back at book covers now and hunt for your signature. That's going to be well. Sometimes they do get cropped. I had an art book come out, and unfortunately, you know, they they cut paintings to fit, and so some of the signatures aren't in there. And so I've driven some people crazy looking for signatures that were actually <laughs> removed. That's funny. I, I was looking at your your Wikipedia page uh, earlier this morning, and they have a picture of you on there with a guy dressed up like Jack Sparrow, and it actually says. Don Mates left. And I was like, duh. Like, <laughs> just cracked me up because I was like, ah, he's probably not the guy dressed up like Jack Sparrow. I think we could have figured that out. Yeah. Now, yeah. One of the, I, so probably one of the things that most people would know you for, but not necessarily know you for, is that you invented the Captain Morgan rum character. Yes, I did that. How did that I, come about? I lived in Connecticut at the time and uh, had an agent in New York City. And the agency dealt with various uh, corporations and, and so forth. And uh, a lot of um, these uh, companies, and the one I worked for was Joseph Seagram's, they come out with new products from time to time. And they decided they were going to launch a spiced rum product. And they wanted to call it Captain Morgan Spiced Rum. And what I understand is that there's a Captain Morgan rum that is overseas in, in England, I believe. And it has its own sort of label. And but this was you know Seagram's product and it was a, a different company and they were doing a spiced version of it and so they were looking for you know something an iconic figure to put on their label and my agent uh, submitted my artwork and and they chose me as being one of the artists to to do um, preliminaries for the uh, for the product. And I can go into this because it's kind of, you know, this is what the artist's life is like. They um, they gave me on January 2nd a meeting to um, show my preliminary sketches, So, which meant that, you know, I'm, I'm doing preliminary works over Christmas and New Year's, and right after New Year's I'm, I'm delivering this. And being in Connecticut, it snows, and um, there was a lot of snow coming down at the, you know, before this, and um, I finished my three... Uh, I did three 8x10 oil paintings of various variations on the theme of Henry Morgan, uh, you know, being on a label for selling rum. And uh, I never do oil paintings as sketches anymore after this because what happened was I um, I lived about two miles from my parents' house and I had a, a little third floor apartment where I did my artwork, but I didn't have enough room up there to have all the framing and matting and, and those kind of devices. So I used my parents' basement as sort of an extension of my studio. And so I brought the sketches to my parents' uh parents' house to um, to put the mats on it so that they would look good when I showed them to the board of directors at Seagram's the next day. And I forgot something and went back up the stairs, came back down, drove to my parents' house, and then I realized that I had left the wet oil painting sketches on the roof of the car. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, like, you know, my heart is in my throat and I'm driving back to where my apartment was looking for, you know, the, these paintings on the side of the road. And I finally found them, and it was right in front of um, McDonald's. <laughs> and you know, 
traffic was going back and forth, and I'm like literally standing in the middle of the street picking up these little wet oil paintings, almost in tears, trying to get the the salt and the road grit and the tire marks off of the paintings. And then, you know, I brought them. You know, I went back to my parents' house and finished doing the framing. And then I was up all night long trying to paint out the tire tracks and 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 get the divots out from underneath where the sand had ground into the paint. Uh, so I was up all night, and I went into New York City the next day with bags under my eyes into a board of directors meeting at Joseph Seagram's and Sons. So that was an an interesting day, to to say the least. And what they ended up doing was saying, "Well, we we like we like this pose, and and we like his hand over here in this one, and we want to give him the red suit in that one." So they kind of you know like did uh, you know Chinese menu for you know what I was doing, and um, I I kind of felt bad about you know what i painted i mean not that you know it wasn't a good pirate to sell rum but it really wasn't henry morgan i mean the costume was you know out of period and you know i mean it was it was red and the the cape and the whole thing but you know it was very iconic and it was eye catching and it obviously sold um very well over the years so um you know i i did my job even though you know henry morgan may be doing a few spins in his grave you know by <laughs> virtual although you know since he you know he he, he ran a uh a sugar plantation and pretty much, you know, died of, uh, of drinking, he probably wouldn't mind at all. You know, I think he'd be very happy to be on a bottle of rum. It, it was probably on his bucket list somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be terrifying though, to have to go dig your paintings out of the street like that. I mean, I can, I have left my guitars places and, and things like that. And, uh, that kind of stuff terrifies me that yeah. uh, plus I, they were oil paintings, right? So those don't even dry yeah. for, those oil. don't even dry for like a they year. Right. Oh. Well, no, they, they, dr- oil paintings are interesting in that, you know, they kind of dry to the touch, uh-huh. but, um, depending how thick they are and what surface you're painting on, they can take it up to a year to dry completely. You know, for example, a color like a lizard crimson, if it's on kind of thick, you want to wait, you know, even more than a year because what happens is if you put a coat of varnish over the oil paint and if the oil paint isn't completely dry all the way, you know, dries from the outside in. Uh-huh. And if you put varnish on, on the surface of an oil painting, it could crack. In other words, you know, the varnish kind of contracts, and if the paint is still gooey underneath, it will cause cracking. And I have one of those paintings here that I've got to do some repairs on mm. that I had varnished too soon in my uh, in my younger years, and I've got to you know figure out how to remove the varnish and then fill in where the paint was and uh, and redo it. So you know, do, on the can it says wait you know six to twelve months before you final varnish a painting. And you really want to varnish an oil painting because um, surface dirt and grit and all gets into um, onto the surface of these things. And if you have a coat of varnish on it, um, the dirt sits on or in the varnish, and the varnish can be removed, and then you have a pristine painting underneath. Huh. Without the varnish, the paint itself becomes discolored and in trouble. And that's why you know it's always a good idea to have a coat of varnish on a painting or put it underneath glass. Sure, sure. Did uh, now I have to ask this? Did they give you one of the giant Captain Morgan sculptures that they put out in front of liquor stores? No, <laughs> no, they paid me, which is you know above par for the course. Um, but uh, but you know what I ended up getting was uh, at one point when I moved to Florida, uh, Seagram's was doing something with Tropicana, and one of their representatives came over here with a with a case of rum. Um, so, you know, I got a little bit of rum from them, but one of the interesting things you can probably find on my website is, um, uh, Don Mates with, uh, a, a, a pile of Captain Morgan boxed behind me and I had gone to the, um, to the bottling plant in Baltimore and got a tour and they took me to where the shipping department was and, you know, floor to 20 foot ceilings were stacked with Captain Morgan. And at the time, they had my artwork on the boxes. So I stood in front of this huge pallet of my boxes. And, and when I show people the photograph, I tell them, yes, this is my garage. <laughs> that has to be awfully exciting to see your your work, uh, that just stacks of it like that. I went one time to, uh, in Florida, a, a, a beach party that was sponsored by um, Henry Morgan or Captain Morgan Spiced Rum, and the local rum distributor was 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 throwing this beach party, and it was it was you know all these people wearing Captain Morgan T-shirts with my artwork on it, and these inflatable Captain Morgan bottles bouncing as people are dancing on the floor, and there's a guy dressed up as Captain Morgan, and he has like 
five or six morganettes in short skirts doing the, the, the rockets behind them. You know, it was just amazing, you know, to see people have so much fun, you know, based on artwork that I had done. Well, it is interesting because it is sort of a, like you were saying, it's it's out of time period and things like that, but it is such an iconic look that even, I, I mean, and I, you know, I've read in other things where they go, oh, it does that doesn't look like anything like Henry Morgan and, you know, all the, the same things that you said and, uh, sure. But it it at the same time it, when you think pirate that's what a pirate looks like. Yep, it was you know it, it basically you know it, it it did its job in that you know Henry Moore everyone knew Captain Morgan was a pirate and this was a pirate's rum so yeah. people you know and, and especially in you know I don't know about California but I know Florida is one of the big uh, distribution centers for the product because so many people are into uh, piracy. Uh, this uh, the next weekend I believe I'm going to on the other coast here to celebrate the, you know, it's, it's an awful thing to celebrate, but the sinking of the 1715 Spanish fleet, uh. which, uh, you know, a hurricane came and, and knocked down the Spanish fleet right on what's called the Treasure Coast. And, right. you know, people go out there with uh, with uh, metal detectors and every now and again come up with, you know, uh, pieces of eight or doubloons or whatever, you know, on the beach because, you know, there were wrecks out there and, um, you know, they, they, the tides just bring them to shore. And the tide, are st- they're still bringing things to shore? That's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely, you know. I mean, they, they they didn't get all the ships, and when the when ships go down, basically, you know, the, the they break apart, and anything heavy goes down. Sure. And um, I worked with uh, Barry Clifford, who found the the Widow, which was the only uh, actual wreck that went down as a pirate ship. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, pirates were, you know, were not, you know, they didn't advertise, you know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> and you know, so what had happened was um, this wreck um, was on a lee shore and it broke apart close enough to shore off of Cape Cod where some, there were a couple of survivors. And um, when the wreck broke apart, the, the wooden part of the wreck went to shore, but anything heavy went down straight down, like all the cannons, and obviously any gold or anything heavy went, you know, down to the bottom. And what happens is the the action of the oceans and the tides and all that and the currents uh, take anything and kind of push it up against each other. And so what happened, uh, particularly in a coast like Cape Cod, where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of action in the sea, uh, things like coins and, and gold dust and, and body parts, you name it, end up into what's called concretions that land around cannons. So when you pull up a cannon, you you put it in an electrolysis tank and you find what's what's on inside, what's stuck to it, basically. Right. And the electrolysis, you know, loosens everything. So they actually found, you know, a shoe and an Inside the shoe, they found a sock, and inside the sock, they found some bones, you know? So it was basically, you know, somebody, you know, in the wreck lost a foot, and it ended up dragged up against the cannon. But um, I was talking to one of the divers down there, and, and I find this stuff interesting. It's like, you know, there's gold dust, and they're down there trying to deal with how am I going to get gold dust up to the surface? Right. And so they decided to use a turkey baster. <laughs> and so they just sucked it up into the turkey baster, and that's how they got their gold dust. Yeah, they have found an amazing amount of stuff from that. Uh, I, I'm I'm uh, uh, desperately wanting to see the traveling display that they've got right now. I think it's in Idaho, in Idaho Falls of all places, which is a, a, a horrible place for anything. Um, well, I was just up in Winnipeg, and it was there not too long ago. And what's interesting is the uh, I I didn't get that job of doing the illustrations. I did it in National Geographic, but not for their tour. Uh-huh. Uh, Greg Manchus did the paintings that were on tour, and he's the one that is currently on the Captain Morgan label. Uh-huh. Um, Anyway, uh, what was interesting was I went to Winnipeg, and they said, yeah, we had the exhibit up here not long ago. And what was interesting about going to Winnipeg, if you know about Winnipeg, it's like in the middle of Manitoba. It's like, you know, it's landlocked. There's sure. nothing around them. Great Lakes are way. I go there, and here's a 1650s catch ship fully rigged in a museum. I'm huh. going, what? You know, it was the most beautiful. It was all made using tools of the time period. It was all hand-carved, varnished. I guess it was, done, it was sponsored by the Hudson Bay um, Trading Company. Okay. And you know, they had, you know, they celebrated their anniversary, and part of their celebration was building this ship. And it was, it was and, you know, so I have all this wonderful reference of a, of a period, you know, catch of 1658 or something. And who would have thought that, you know, you know, Winnipeg would have this thing? But it does, you know. That's fantastic. I actually just... Uh, finished reading the the National Geographic book 
uh, with some of your work in it uh, about that, about the, the white. It's a fantastic work in there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really great. So the last thing I want to ask you about is uh, 20 years, mm, yeah, 20 years ago at this point, you had some paintings stolen, according to your website. Yes. What happened with that? Don't know. Uh, we were probably targeted in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we we can't say for sure. Uh-huh. You know, it, it, it you know basically the case has been sealed by uh, FedEx's lawyers. Mm. But what had happened was, um, uh, I think we were um, not very smart in our shipping habits with mm. FedEx. We were going to the same uh, gig. It was uh, something called the World Fantasy Convention. It still happens, and it happens in different cities all over the United States. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. you know, if you look at the the list of who's coming to the world fantasy convention and you see an artist's name on it and um and 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 at the time we were using very identifiable shipping crates so that you know you could pretty much tell somebody what what the crate looked like over the telephone mm-hmm. and um so it was very identifiable and we we used fedex all the time so um it's very likely that you know the system could have been hacked or it's possible that the driver was crooked you know i found out later he was fired um, and, you know, we, we just don't know. I mean, you know, there's so much mixed information. Some people said there were computers on the truck and people stepped over the computers to get at the paintings. You know, we thought that maybe it was musical, you know, people thought it was musical equipment and maybe they got the wrong thing. And, and, you know, the, the, you know, the artwork is in the, is in the, um, Boston Harbor. I mean, we just had no idea, you know, it was just, um, it blindsided us. And now we're much more careful when we, when we ship and, um, you know, it's it's just you know, a, and we don't know. You know, I mean, they could be you know in the bottom of the bottom of the bay. They could be in somebody's basement. You know, we we just don't know. We've heard some uh, indications that they may be around, but nothing to prove it. You know, I mean, there was there were a couple of rumors that were unsubstantiated. So we we just don't know. You know, it's 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 a scary thing. And um, uh, how, you know, how many how many we, were stolen? Well, my wife is an artist, uh-huh. as as I, and she does her own book covers. And three of her paintings were stolen, and twenty of mine were. Uh-huh. Um, I had a number of very small paintings. They were like nine by twelve or eight by ten that were for a game company, and I was showing them off for the first time. So they were like, you know, my favorite paintings out of sixty that I had done for a game card company, something like Magic: The Gathering, but something different. And I actually had a couple of um, Stephen King paintings that were for a book called Desperation that I illustrated that were in the in the box as well, and um, and, a, and a book cover or two. Ah, that's and, a shame. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it was it it hit us hard. We weren't expecting. You know, we thought you know we would hit damage, but we never thought we would get would get thieved. And so you know, we're we're more careful now. You know, I mean, using we don't use our own name when we ship. You know, we, we, we you know, found out the hard way how to uh, do anonymous packaging for valuables. Huh, that's interesting. I, I would never have thought of it. And it's interesting that they've uh, not shown up in, in auctions or sales or, or anything like that. Well, there is a service called um, IFAR. It's an international fine art registry. Uh-huh. And um, the people at the convention we went to felt so bad that we lost our paintings that they passed around a hat and 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 contributed enough money for our paintings to be registered. So if any of this artwork ever appears in an auction like a Christie's or something like that, um, you know, it would be, tar- you know, it would be available to be um, located. Oh, so, that's you know, good. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, basically, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law with, with something like this. So, uh-huh. you know, you have to be very um, vigilant. And in, in, in talking to, you know, people that steal artwork, generally they steal more um, anonymous looking artwork, you know, bucolic scenes, landscapes, things that can, you know, easily be passed. But, you know, when you have something that, you know, is like fantastic art, it's very identifiable. So, sure. you know, either either it's, you know, either it's drowned or, you know, it's, it's hidden away somewhere um, because, you know, it's just a very identifiable product. Well, you got to get your uh, shipwreck diver friends to go uh, <laughs> search around for those. Yeah, yeah. Look at the box. <laughs> oh, when, when we lost it, we were looking in dumpsters down alleys, you know, because we thought that you know someone would, you know, we were looking for our crate. You know, I mean, the driver claimed that you know a hundred and fifty pound crate on on metal wheels jumped out of the back of the truck and ran away. Is basically what he told the police. You know, <laughs> he's probably got a few stereos too. Yeesh. Yeah. 
probably yeah. does, you know. That's and crazy. It was it was a, it was just you know a, a very you know long weekend. That's for sure. I'm sure. Well, on a nicer note, what do you have coming up in the uh, in the future here? Uh, I am uh, going to be in Allentown, Pennsylvania, doing something called a LuxCon. This is the seventh one, and it's at the Allentown Art Museum. And it's a very unique exhibit because it's um, all fantastic art. It's juried. People come from all over the world um, to buy and also exhibit. You know, the art. And last year, um, an Australian artist who works in the movie industry was my neighbor, and a, a guy from England was next door. And you know, so it's a it's a tough crowd to get in, but it's pretty much the the very top imaginative realists in the world are exhibiting in this museum and it's for a long weekend and uh, the museum basically sells space and we go in there and we get you know like x number of feet of wall space and we hang whatever we want there and we can sell it right out of the museum so people come from literally all over you know there were a lot of british guys and people from california and and one guy from Hawaii was coming to buy artwork, but you know, it's if if you look at the who's who of do of of who is doing the best cover art these days, uh, movie people, um, all kinds of of you know talented imaginative artists that aren't working digital, they're actually working in paint, uh-huh. have their artwork on display at this and they're for sale. That's fantastic. I need to I'm book actually a- driving from Florida to Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, that sounds like my life. Now I need to book a gig in Allentown, Pennsylvania, so I can go see that. Yes, that sounds well, very after cool. After this year, we'll be in Reading. So, um, and hey, you know, it could happen. When we were there last year, we couldn't get a um, we couldn't get a hotel room. I mean, not a hotel room, a, a restaurant, because everything was reserved for a Tom Petty concert. So they, you know, they do oh. concerts right downtown. Crazy. You say next year it's going to be in Reading, in Reading, California. No, Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, Reading, Pennsylvania. That's the wrong one. That's <laughs> well, the guy that runs it is is from the Pennsylvania area. Oh, I he, see. He started this small in a town called Altoona, and it was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you know, it took like four flights to to even get in the neighborhood before you rented a car for two hours. So, <laughs> uh, you know, having it in um, Allentown and Reading and and having it in a museum was was very special. In fact, um, uh, we had a unique experience where they wrote up the show in American Artist Magazine and also Art Connoisseur Magazine. Oh, neat. Um, and this, the initial show that happened there was 200 years of um, fantastic art. And they had artists there like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Roger Dean that did all the cool Yes album covers. Sure. Um, he was there with his artwork, and um, you know, Frank Frazetta had paintings there, Jeff Jones, um, Boris Vallejo was there with his wife. Um, it was pretty much a who's who of who did fantastic art in the last 200 years. Wow, that is um, really a cool thing. It was like over 160 works. It was it was really spectacular. Who knew? In the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Yeah, well, yeah, there you are. That's and great. Starting to, New York galleries are starting to to come on board. I guess in uh, at the end of this month, the beginning of next month, there's a um, fantastic art exhibit going on in um, New York City at the Jack. Levine Gallery, I believe, in Midtown Manhattan. So, you know, it's starting to catch on. I mean, people are realizing that, um, you know, this artwork is literally based on, you know, the works done by, like, Hieronymus Bosch and Leonardo da Vinci doing all those imaginative, um, you know, science, science-based science drawings that he was doing. And uh, Michelangelo, you know, I mean, he was illustrating the Bible. I mean, you know, putting, you know, having God reach his hand out to Adam is pretty imaginative, you know. And he was doing, <laughs> illustrating, you know, the most imaginative imaginative scenes from the Bible. So, you know, he was very much an imaginative realist right back then, you know. And uh, we're working hard to connect the dots with people realizing that, you know, this stuff isn't just, you know, uh, you know, fun stuff for little kids. I mean, you know, there have been, you know, some of the most respected artists, you know, of all time have been doing this kind of thing. Um, you know, an artist named William Bougereau, who was, you know, the acknowledged master of the French Academy, was doing satyrs and, and, and cherubs and, and arrows with, with wings and arrows and cupids and, and all kinds of things. And this is all imaginative stuff, you know. That's great. Well, we're going to have to figure out how to get a showing out here in California because I need there to see is some one, of that stuff. Actually, oh, is in there? Stockton. Yes. At the, at, what is it? The, is there something called the Delta College? Oh, yeah. Stockton. Delta College in Stockton. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Yes, it's coming up. Uh, you know, uh, look, you know, look it up. You know, it's 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 coming up shortly. I just submitted uh, six works for that, and it's being juried by uh, uh, someone who does. Uh, her name is Terrell. Oh, uh, I can't remember uh, Whitaker. She uh, she works for Lucas Films, and she did work for uh, Men in Black, and and she's a creature designer. And okay. She's, she, judge and um you know it's going to be in a college and artwork will be for sale so it's you know it's stuff coming in california oh great well i will definitely look that up oh that's great yeah that's only about two hours for me so i'm gonna go oh is it all right um you know i can i can give you more information on it if i can you know find the freaking paperwork (laughs) um actually i might okay it is uh imagine the fantastic uh juror is terrell whitlatch uh, gallery exhibit October eight through November five. Okay, great. I think I'm even in California during that time. I'll put it in the show notes for the episode and make sure we get cool. some people out there. So that's great. Well, Don, this has been super fun. I really enjoyed talking to you. This was really great. Did I miss anything? Anything you would like to bring up? Well, you might say that I am married to uh, Jenny Wirtz. Okay. Okay. And um, she is one of the. She's a, a very um, unique person in that she is an author. She's written 19 novels, and they're of um, they're they're fantasy novels, but more like adult fantasy, like Game of Thrones, where you know you you have to use your brain to figure out things, and it's not you know like for children, or and it's not you know uh, paranormal romance or anything like that. She writes um, adventure stories um, with with you know where you have to kind of figure out what's going on, so it's not you know a a, um, a simple book but it is a very intense books and um and she's an artist as well and she's done all her own covers and all the maps inside and um you know, i mentioned howard Pyle way back when and uh-huh. you know he did that and and she grew up in howard Pyle, um the area where howard Pyle lived and and she was very much inspired by howard Pyle. in fact one of her paintings hangs at the delaware art museum which was founded around howard Pyle. Uh-huh. and um she has works that are available on Audible as um, as narrated books. Um, she has a very one called Master of Whitestorm that is narrated by Simon Preble, who is you know an audio an Audible Award winner. And um, she has books on eBooks, and um, she's written a, a an epic fantasy called The Wars of Light and Shadow. And she's right now writing the second to the last in that series. And what's interesting is that you're getting an artist's point of view when she describes her scenery. So it's very, very. And she actually taught me how to ride horses, how to sail. <laughs> so she, you know, she she comes at you know at, at being a novelist from from experience. Oh, that's fantastic! It sounds like a a very happily creative household. That's amazing. Well, it is. You know, I remember when she was writing the collaboration with Ray Feist. Um, I was doing the artwork for the covers, and she was sort of, you know, describing what how she imagined things to look in the book as she was co-writing with Ray. So it was a, an interesting collaboration where she was collaborating with the author, the other half of the authorship, and she was collaborating with me on the visuals. Huh. Um, so it was a it was a, a fun fun project. That's great. Well, I will I will make sure to get a link up to some of her stuff in the show notes oh, as well. Do. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Don, like I said, this fact, has been really fun. Is Captain Morgan at one point. Oh, did <laughs> it's on our collaborative website. If you go in and look for the collaborative website, you'll see my wife up a ladder with a sword and a Captain Morgan suit. That is fantastic. That uh, that's probably there's there's probably some weird cosplay joke in there somewhere that's not coming to me yeah, right now. Yeah. But, you know, what are you going to do? She was the only one that fit in the costume. You know, <laughs> I couldn't get in. It was too small. <laughs> That's great. Well, Don, this has been so much fun. It really, really has. I'm looking forward to getting this interview out for everybody to listen to. Well, thank you so much for contacting me. I really appreciate you know being able to you know to um, you know ex- explain a little bit. You know, I mean, people look at a painting and you know they go, "Well, what was he thinking?" You know, or "Why did he do that?" And you know, it, when we exhibit at museums, you know, the docents are just in awe that you know the artist is there because most of the time, you know, they're you know they're they're no longer alive and they're trying to figure out what they were doing. So. All these interviews are just wonderful because it gives a, a more personal um, uh, reaction to what the visuals are. Absolutely, and that's what makes the the art really work in in, uh, in my brain, anyway. Oh, that's cool, and you know, I really appreciate you contacting me and having a lot of fun with this. It's you bet. You. you bet. Well, let's talk again soon. I hope we can.
Yeah, I'd love to. And, and I hope you see the show over there. I definitely will. All right. Thanks, Don. I will talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, bye-bye. And there you go, friends. That was my interview with painter Don Mates. How cool was that? I, the the whole story where he drops the, the leaves the paintings on the top of the car and drives. Oh, it just made my heart hurt, man. Uh, made my heart hurt. But lots of interesting, cool stuff in there. You can find Don Mates on the internet. He's got a great, uh, sort of a weird uh, website URL. Uh, so I'm just I'm going to put a link to it on the show notes at uh, underthecrossbones.com. So just come by there. It's too, You won't remember it if I tell it to you. So just come by underthecrossbones.com, check out episode number seven show notes, and there will be a link to Don's website there. you got to see his paintings. you got to see his other work. It's really great stuff. I'll also have uh, some information about the uh, the two events that he was talking about, uh, as well as a, a couple of examples of his paintings he's going to let me post. So that's uh, that's very cool. So come by underthecrossbones.com, uh, episode number seven, show notes, all that kind of good stuff is there. Let's get into some comedy music. As I mentioned, our comedian today is David Niker, a very a, a gentleman with a large beard uh, and uh, and a Jewish background. Uh, that'll get you into it. So, uh, David Niker, following that is going to be, yes, a song from me called Kissing in the Rain, which I'm pretty proud of, and I hope you like it. So, here we go. Dave Niker, and then some music from me. Here it goes. Some religions like beards. Those guys love beards. Some religions don't like beards. I was in Salt Lake City not too long ago doing comedy. No beards? No beards in Salt Lake City. They're very religious. I, I, you know, I don't have anything against other people and their religions. Well, till I went to Salt Lake City. <laughs> I went, took the tour of the, you know, they give you the tour of the compound there. First building we went into, over every doorway, six-pointed star. I'm Jewish. My name's David. That's my star. <laughs> So I said to the Mormon lady, hey, what's going on with the six-pointed star? She said, oh, that's the star of Jubilee. <laughs> hey, you can't just put Belie on the end of it and pretend we're not going to notice. <laughs> I don't walk around with a cross on huh? Oh, that's the cross of, hey, Zeus was the best Greek god. <laughs> what's she going to do next? Show me a Muslim flag? Oh, that's the Mormon flag of Allah. Your gods are terrific. <laughs> Stupid Mormons. Storming like the worst it's ever been We'll be kidding 
Thank you very much, friends, for listening. Uh, you heard some comedy from Dave Niker, who you can find. His website is called the Internet is wasting my time.com. That's the Internet is wasting my time.com. That's where you can find more uh, stuff from Dave Niker. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the song Kissing in the Rain by Phil Johnson at Roadside Attraction. That's me uh, and my band. And uh, so you can find us at roadsideattraction.com and, uh, and download that tune and all that kind of good stuff. And I'll post the uh, the lyric video in the show notes for this one as well. You can also find uh, Don Mates. I'll link to his website on the uh, on the show notes too. And coming up next week, we have an interview with Dave Ladage, who is the owner of a clothing company called Living Like a Pirate. It's a little bit outside uh, from uh, a lot of stuff, but it's a different angle on the whole pirate thing, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So, like I said, go leave those reviews and comments and all that kind of stuff on iTunes. Super appreciate it. And I will talk to you next week. Thanks. Thanks.